And I'd like to introduce to you one of our founding members, Guy Wallace, who is going to introduce our speaker. So thank you, Guy. Thank you, Gary. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Patty Shank, who is renowned in the business of instructional systems design or instructional design. I've known Patty for probably close to 10 years, maybe a little bit less, through social media only. And we met today for the very first time, um, the power of social media. And I have learned a tremendous amount from her. And um, I would highly recommend that you check out her books here in no particular order is, this is part of her Deeper Learning series. Now what impressed me about Patty from the very beginning was her deep knowledge for deeper learning, she understands the research and she pursues the research and so in my mind she's all about evidence-based practices for performance improvement, which is what ISPI is all really about. Um, many of us work in the L&D or T&D space, the instructional space, and Patty does that as well. And her book, Practice and Feedback for Deeper Learning, is excellent. It's one of the thing, keys to creating good training or learning is having valid practice and feedback. Um, feel free to come and take a look at these books here at the end of the session. Um, as we give them away, you can arm wrestle with the person that wins the book. <laughs> Managing memory for deeper learning and write or, and organize for deeper learning. So she's written a series of books prior to this series of three. She's working on a fourth book, but she's written a lot for uh, ASTD in particular, I think. And uh, um, I would encourage you, if you're on social media, if you follow any of that, follow her on Twitter. Um, I don't see you as often on LinkedIn, but you're there. Right, I'm there occasionally. Anyway, so without further ado, Patty Shank. Thank you very much for coming out to see me tonight. Um, I was really anxious about, I, I flew in from Denver, and um, I had a couple anxieties, and one of them was that I've had this cold for three weeks. Two, well, my, my daughter calls me the hyperbolizer. Um, two and a half weeks. And as of yesterday, I still had a hard time talking because my nose is stuffed up. Um, so I was worried about that, and you would all think, that sounded really awful, and I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, um, and, and one of the other major anxieties I had would, was whether my connectors would work. I don't know if you go to conferences and you have to end up bringing connectors with you. I've got four or five. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. And can we just thank the, the um, LCD screen, or I guess it's it's uh, projected for for doing its job in my connector working. Thank you <laughs> very much. Um, I sent I sent extra slides to Chris today because I just never know. Um, I, I don't know what it is about these things. A hundred dollars, they work once, don't work again. Um, anybody else had that experience? Really, it, it's just a, a nightmare. Um, Guy asked me to tell you a little bit about myself. About three years ago, I, I decided to write that I was going to, that I didn't think that what was going on in L&D in most organizations really had the ability to change outcomes. And so I made a decision. I, I told my husband, who's now my ex, let you tell you something. <laughs> Um, that I was going to take three years off and write. I was going to read the research on common problems in L&D and find out what does the research say. And uh, some great things happened. One is I learned a ton, which is the whole reason to do most everything to begin with. Um, for instance, I learned when, when writing practice and feedback that my ideas about feedback were wrong. Um, um, there's very specific advice, and it comes from many years of research on what, when's the best time to give feedback and what should you give feedback on. Um, I also came to understand that grading and feedback are not the same thing. 
Um, and so I'm not going to speak on that tonight, but you're probably going to go like, well, why are you talking about it? Okay. Just to give you some idea of where all of this came, I just decided I was going to do this. And I, it's been a fabulous journey. It's changed my career. Um, and I absolutely love doing this. So I'm going to talk about memory tonight. I'm going to talk about memory because if we don't understand memory, we cannot design for it, right? Um, if we don't design for memory, how our memories work, then our outcomes, everything to me is, how do we make outcomes better? What do we do? What does the research say? People say to me, well, I read a research study last week that said um, if you drank 15 cups of coffee a day, you would live longer. It's like, and then there's 800 that say something different. So, so people are always asking me, well, how do you deal with the research when there's research that says this and then there's research that says that? Big, biggest example of that is nutrition research, right? My background is, is as a health educator. That's where I started. Um, and so I've always been interested in research because it says this, it says this, it says this, it says that. So the research I'm going to talk to you tonight about is what I call the preponderance of research. And people often say to me, well, Patty, research changes over time. Yes, true. Science changes over time. But this is what we know. This is what the preponderance of research tells us right now. And the research on cognition, learning, has not changed much in, say, the last 40 years. We've learned extra. We've, we've learned that things we knew before are, are more true than we realized. And we've learned about nuances in the research. So I'm going to be talking about memory because memory is central to all these things that are on the screen. And without knowing how to design for research, of design for memory, we're stuck just designing. And it's not good enough because memory is everything with learning and applying. Um, you don't need to take notes if you don't want to. I will give you a link at the end to slides um, and all the slides. And I also threw in pieces from each of my books. Um, so, when I talk about research, what, what am I talking about? Well, here are some examples of foundational research on, on how we learn and how memory is involved. Um, I'm not going to talk you through these three. Um, I assure you they're hard to read and boring. Um, some, of, <laughs> some of us love it. Um, I'm really one of those people that's super happy that there's people in the world that like to do different things. Um, most of the people hate doing what I do, which just makes me happy because I love it. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit. The one on, we're going to go left to right. The one on the left is from Robert Bjork, and, and he's he's done tons of research on training and memory, and um, just really a well-known researcher. And this chapter, memory and meta-memory considerations in the training of human beings. Man, doesn't that sound fascinating? Um, you can laugh. Um, there, for those of you who have a PhD or are getting one, you are required to make it as boring and as <laughs> difficult to understand as humanly possible. Um, I told my dissertation advisor that I was going to, one of my favorite words is icky, and that I was going to get that into my dissertation. She says, I'm going to find it and it's going to come out. <laughs> it's in there. <laughs> she didn't find it. So, so, so Bjork's chapter discusses how memory works and what are the implications for the training of human beings. Um, the, swell, the middle one is Sweller and Chandler. These folks have done tons of research. I've read a ton of their research. Swell, Sweller is extremely well known. And this paper explains why some content is very difficult to learn and what are the implications. And you have probably noticed in the, the work that you do that some stuff doesn't stick well. Some stuff is hard to understand. Some stuff has lots of misunderstandings. Um, and this explains some of that. So all of these 
are foundational. And the one on the right is, is uh, Mayor Marino's paper that, that described in detail the attributes and limitations of memory. And this has been studied over and over and over and over again. Anybody um, heard of Miller's 5 plus or minus 2? Sure. Well, later research has shown that's too much. Yeah, so you know that, right? Um, so so um, that, that it's less than 5. It's probably 3 plus or minus 2. Um, um, and that's very nuanced, and I won't get into the nuances of that, but, but you'll get some idea about that. I, I'm a firm believer in practice, because when I read about practice and the research, I realized something I already knew, but knew even more. Without practice, we cannot learn to apply. We cannot learn, and we cannot apply. Learning comes first, application comes first as a result of practice. And so we're going to, I'm going to do less tonight than I would normally want to do. I could probably cover 30 tactics on, on memory, but I'm going to cover four, and we're going to practice. So I'm going to give you a second to either open, open a fine piece of paper, um, steal one from someone nearby you, or if you don't have paper, and sometimes I don't, Open the notes application on your phone, you can use that. So the first part here, you're not going to be doing a lot of pra practicing. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how memory works. I'm going to simplify it a whole lot. Um, so if you're a memory researcher or a neuro neuroscientist, and I was just at a conference where I was talking about this, and a neuroscientist came up to me and said, you left stuff out. Yep, I did because I'm not a neuroscientist and I understand it at a certain level and I'm talking about it at, a, at another level. Um, so we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about memory and learning, how it happens, how do we get from information to learning to application. Really fascinating. And then I'm going to talk about four tactics. I may not make it through all four tactics because I'm not going to go over. I want you to stop me and ask questions. And this is important to me. I don't care if I finish. Um, I'm not here to cover content. I'm here to help you have an understanding of how incredibly critical memory is um, and how to do some ways of designing with memory and not against it because we design against it all the time. And if we design against it, it simply means people cannot learn. And if they cannot learn, they cannot remember, and they cannot apply. And that's the reason we're, we're doing the work we do. Uh, it's the only reason, so we have to do it this way. So we get better learning and performance outcomes when we use tactics that, that work in accordance with how memory works. So we have to do so. Okay, so I'm going to talk about memory and learning first. And I'm going to talk about three types of memory, sensory, working, and long-term, um, in that order. Um, and they go in that order because we have to sense it first before we can learn. So that's what I'm talking about first, is sensory memory. And I'm going to have you experience it in just a second. So processing new information starts with what our senses bring into our brain. But our, there's literally tons of, of sensory information around us all the time. We simply do not process it all. And you will hear me say this over and over again. We process based on what we already think is important. So prior knowledge. Prior knowledge means what we already know. I'm going to use that word over and over again. And so I want you to experience sensory memory for just a second. And could you stand, if, if you can stand, if you can't, don't. And I want you to just stare at, at the image on that screen. And if, if someone's in front of you, just get somewhere else. I want you to just keep staring at it. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stop staring at it and close your eyes. And for about half a second, 
most of you will see that image and it'll be gone. Okay? So stare and now close your eyes and see if you see it. Anyone see it? Okay, you can sit down again. Um, how many of you didn't see it? Anyone? Yeah. Um, if you do it long enough, you'll, you'll see it. And, and feel free to do that with any of my images. Just stare at it and then close your eyes. You're only going to, sensory memory is half a second to two seconds maximum. Um, we don't retain it. But if we don't sense it, if it doesn't make it through our sensory memory buffers, it's gone. That's it. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this tonight, but we have to make sure people sense it because it's gone otherwise. We can't go to the sensory memories first. Um, and it comes from our environment. Our, we are literally overwhelmed with sensory memory and our brain chooses what to sense based on what it thinks is important. I'll give you an example of that. Anybody decided to buy a car recently? Okay, so when you were looking at cars, did you notice all the cars on the road? Right. And did you notice them, say, five months ago? Probably not. Yeah, so your brain chose to notice other cars, like, well, I'm thinking about, about buying that Mazda or, or, or that Subaru or whatever. And all of a sudden, you see Mazdas and Subarus. They're just annoying other people taking up your road the day before, right? So, so sensory memory uses what it thinks is important for you to sense based on, on what's going on in your life and based on what you already know. If you like cats, I like cats. Um, you notice cats. If you like dogs, you notice dogs. You know, it's just the way our brain works. So the important thing here is when we don't sense something, it's lost. It's gone. It's filtered out. Yes? Are there some senses that are more impactful than others? Did you see any research about that? Um, I did. Um, that, that things that, that are emotionally taxing in one way or another or tied to something important to you are, are senses that tend to make it through. We also know it's not just what's in your prior memory, it's also what's in your DNA. Um, loud noises are always going to pull your senses. So if you're sitting here and somebody screams out there, you're done with what, what I'm talking about. You're there. And we're just built that way. So we have, we have certain inborn things that pull our senses um, and, and have us concentrate on them. Um, but mostly it's, it's different. You know, he was looking for a car, so we saw cars. Um, I had a friend once who, was, who wanted a pink wedding dress. And she spent a year looking at, at different shades of pink and taking pictures. So it's, it's kind of, your brain's filtering it for you. Some of it, a large portion of it's unconscious. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next, the next step, which is, is working memory. If your brain processes a sense as important, it then goes to working memory to be processed. Process B means that it's given meaning by what you already know. Again, prior, prior knowledge gives meaning to what you're learning. Um, and so this is why people with expertise in the subject learn new stuff about that subject very easily because they already have tons of prior knowledge from which to make meaning of, of that thing. And if you're training new people in something they've never learned before, they're going to have a very difficult time. Um, so let me tell you a few things about working memory. Working memory um, is, is the thing that, that Miller talked about, five plus or minus two. Um, working memory is very, limited, but it absolutely has to process. If it doesn't process, you haven't learned it, um, and it won't go any further. Um, that's it. It's done. So processing is what working memory is about. It's limited in capacity and time. Capacity is very low, 
time is very short. So when we talk about the attributes and limitations uh, of memory, we're primarily talking about working memory. And so work at, working memory um, can't be taxed. If it's taxed, we don't learn. We cannot process. Um, so have you ever heard someone say, well, we've got a ton to learn today? Sorry, not possible. Um, this, is, this is my big aha for, from reading the, the memory research was, however much we think we're going to cover, we're going to cut, we're, people, covering isn't it. Um, it's what they process. Here's, there's two implications of this that I want to point out. There's lots of implications. But there's two that I want to point out. One is, is that, that um, deep processing is necessary for remembering an application. So we've got to do deep processing exercises and activities with people. That takes time. Time means that we can't cover a lot. I had someone say to me, I want to hire you to teach me how to um, get this fire hose of training to people in one day. And I said, well, that's a problem because if you try to drink from a fire hose, it's going to tear off your skin and you're still going to be thirsty because you can't drink from it. Um, and the same is true for learning, that we simply cannot pour information into people's heads. It has to be sensed first in sensory memory and processed in working memory. Those are necessary. They're not, they're not sufficient, but they're necessary. And the other tactic is that if we ask people to exceed the limits of working memory, they simply don't learn. And if they don't learn, they cannot remember and they cannot apply. So we'll add the last piece, and that's long-term memory. So I said earlier that sensory memory decides what to sense and to pass through to you based on what's going on in your mind, what, what you already know, what you're thinking about, what you think might be important. And I said that we make meaning um, in working memory based on what we already know. Well, where is this work? Where is this prior knowledge we're talking about? What are we talking about here? Um, is it throughout your body? Well, here's what we think. We think that it's in, we call it long-term memory, and what it is, is it's stored knowledge. But it's not just stored, it's stored in, in, in an organ organized fashion. If you look at, at, at uh, processing, you'll see just single chunks. But when it's stored in long-term memory, and it has to be stored in long-term memory to be used, to be remembered and used and acted upon and applied. Um, if it's, in order to get there, we have to deeply process. In order to store it, it goes into, into organized, um, what we call schema, what, what the researchers call schema. And we don't really know where that is or what it looks like, but, but I, I made a, just, this is what I think it looks like. Um, kind of like org charts. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove to you you have schema. How many people do the exact same thing when they get up in the morning every day? They have a process they follow, okay? Anyone else? Right, that's your get up in the morning schema. Um, okay, and here's one of mine. Does anybody go to the grocery store and follow the same path through the grocery store every single time? Does anybody write their grocery list so it matches that path? That's your grocery shopping schema. Um, and the same information can be held in various schemas, right? Um, so, so the basis of expertise, the ability to problem solve, is having highly organized and deep schema. That is our job, you and I. Our job is to make sure people have the schema to do their jobs. Um, we are not just giving them information. Um, and that's, that's an understanding that I hope to convey 
is that it is our job is not to deliver content. Our job is to give to get people to process well enough so that it goes on to long-term memory um, for storage. That does not happen, by the way. It does not happen overnight, and it doesn't happen in a day. And, and it happens over time. Um, so there's some implications there. The implication, the main implication for me is, if we don't teach this way, if we don't teach for remembering and application, which means deep processing and making sure that people act appropriately and accurately store what they're learning, then what we're doing is pretty much for nothing. That's positive, isn't it? <laughs> OK. So based on what I just said to you, can somebody tell me an implication of what I just said? What should we do to design with and not against memory? Anyone? Companies that corral adults into a training environment for the purposes of feeding them information, and it's not an appreciated value, it's most investment, most money. Right, so what he said is if we crowd people together to feed large quantities of information, and we've all been to things like that, right? If we want people to be able to remember and apply, we have to go further than what we normally do. We have to design in a way that they can experience this order of right. memory so that they can we can never assume that people already have enough schema so that we can start at long-term memory. We right. have to design in a way right. to be able to everyone through this process. No, that's a good one. So she's saying that we have to design to make sure people experience this process. They need to sense it. They need to process it. They need to store it. Um, and otherwise, it's just simply lost. And the investment in what you and I do is lost with it. Um, and it's, real, it's not that easy. This isn't the easiest thing on earth. Building content and just throwing it at people is pretty simple. Um, that's, that's why I wrote the books that I did, is that what does the research say we have to be doing? And here's what I found. I found that, for the most part, this stuff's not that hard. It's just timely and uh, time-consuming. And time-consuming is it, well, how many of your organizations want, want people to know this yesterday? <laughs> all of them. Right, all, every single one of them. Several months ago. Right, several months ago, <laughs> preferably before you even started. Um, it just doesn't work that way. We don't. Now, we can inform people. In other words, we give them information um, and maybe do a little processing so they can figure out where that information is if they need it later. We could probably do that fairly quickly, but if we're training people to do a job, um, it takes time. Um, I, I had an experience where, where I was working with a company and they said to me, our training sessions, our, our training for customer service reps is six weeks long, but there's a problem. By the time they get to week three, they've already forgotten week one. And the, the research is very clear about how to fix that. There's, there's fairly easy ways to fix that. Look, um, so is there any benefit of triggering more than just one sensory to really help something stick? So yes, um, the research um, says that, that um, there's a whole bunch of stuff around this. And it, it's around dual processing both visual and, and auditory. Um, and there's just a ton of stuff on this. If you're interested, I can I can send the stuff to you. So just get, I'm easy to find. It's patty at pattyshank.com. One problem, Patty's with an I, because my mom had me right after Patty Page was very popular. <laughs> <laughs> so if you send it to Patty with a Y at pattyyshank.com, it won't get them. Um, so, so absolutely, I'm happy to talk to you about dual coding. Um, it has to be applied right. Um, so I'll give you an example. And by the way, I'm sorry, but I'm super easy to get off track. Um, so if you ask me a question and I keep, no, you're not, I want you to do this, okay? I want this, no. But if 
I go on and on, and I haven't, I haven't moved forward at all, somebody do this, <laughs> okay? Um, so, so here's one of the implications of dual coding. We can't read text and read a diagram at the same time. So if the text is describing the diagram, we've got a problem. We're reading the text, we're looking at the diagram. We're reading the text, we're looking at the diagram. That's a problem. And so one, one of the most clear implications of this one is, is whenever possible, when you're describing a complex diagram or image or whatever, use audio. That's the most famous one of all, it is using audio so that someone can listen and look at the diagram. Um, there's, some, there's some usability and, and some accessibility implications of that, too. Um, so here, here's what I came up with, and, and you guys pretty much covered these. Number one, we have to design so what's important is noticed so it makes it into sensory memory. We have to make sure we never overload working memory, and um, we have to intentionally figure out what schema we want people to have for this task, this job, this outcome, and train to build that schema, and then check understanding to make sure that's the schema that people have. That's our, in my view of the world, when we're training, <coughs> the most important thing for us to be doing is intentionally building accurate schema for the tasks and the job. It's a, different, it's a huge difference between education and training, um, although in education, we still are building schema. We're building domain schema of various, various domains that you're learning. Um, but here we're building task schema. Just like I have, a ta I have a task schema for grocery shopping. Um, and I don't think about how to grocery shop. I, it's so well embedded that I just go in there and do it. Except if they're having a sale. <laughs> so what do you say? Well, you showed on that last one that um, design is still what's important. So, but if that's important to, let's say, the task or the job or the business outcome, but it, it, it's never important to the learner or to the employee, is it a done deal there? No, no. Um, there's lots of ways to make it important to someone. One is, is by having people answer questions. It suddenly becomes important. You know, that's one of the reasons for certain questioning techniques um, to just get people to stop. Um, our brains do not like questions that are unanswered. So even if you're not likely to speak up, you're pro probably searching in your brain for the answer to that question. We know that. Um, designing so things are noticed, has, again, just like what you were talking about, about using multiple senses, Research tells us designing for things to be noticed has a ton of tactics. And one of them is don't put a whole bunch of other stuff around the stuff you want to be noticed. Take stuff out um, and keep, you know, use bold. But, but you can't use bold everywhere because then it's all the same level, right? So there's a ton of stuff. There's stuff we can use about how our brain processes things that people don't even realize that they're processing. You know, questions are a really good one. Um, or asking, asking people to tell you how that, having them apply it in their own situation, really good. Because um, a lot of people will say, well, that doesn't apply to me, except it does. And have them think through that. So I'm going to now talk about four specific tactics. Um, and if I don't cover them all, that's fine. Stop me. I'm going to cover some very foundational tactics um, that, are, that are true in every instance. Um, or pretty much, I, yeah, I'm back to being the hyperbolizer. But, but, um, and these tactics come from the four books. And each book has about 25 to 30 tactics. So I'm not covering a lot. But this is where we get into the exercises. So if you have, if you have paper or you've got a notes application, I'm going to ask you to rewrite some things. Because the foundation of clear instruction is writing. So that's why I wrote the first book is like, does the research actually tell us 
that writing for instruction is different? And the answer is yes. Um, so I'm, right, I'm going to talk about the first three tactics that you can use tonight when you get home or tomorrow morning, because they're, they're so easy to apply. Um, and people will find a huge bang for their buck in, in these three tactics. And then I picked another one um, that I hope we'll get to that we should be doing every time we train. Remember I told you we have to process, we have to slow down, we have to make sure people are, are actually putting this correctly into the schema. That's not happening in an event-based training, but it's what we're starting. We're starting the process. So we're going to talk about readability first, because um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, because you will see huge um, issues when you do this. I do, and I, use, I do this all the time. So we're going to start with testing readability, and then the next two, two and three, are about fixing problems with readability. Um, and this is where you get to go back to uh, elementary school and middle school and high school and remember stuff your English teacher told you um, that, that we, we write the wrong way in many cases for instruction. Okay, so we're going to stop, start with testing readability. Anybody heard the term readability? Anybody already do it? Okay, super easy. You can do this tonight if you want to. Um, so testing readability is, the reason for it is figuring out whether the information that we have designed is actually understandable. Um, and, and it goes beyond readability, but, it, but this is where it starts. Okay, so readability is the ease with which someone can understand written text. And I know somebody probably has, has the thought, wait a minute, what about video scripts and what about audio scripts? Do they start with, with text? They usually do. Almost everything we design starts with text. Um, and so we want, to under, we want to know how those words are understood by our learners or prospective learners. Um, and readability essentially is a statistical measure, sorry. Um, but you don't have to do any statistics because there are tools for this and they're very simple. And I'm going to show you two. One, I bet you already have. How many of you use Word? If you have Word, you've already got readability statistics built in. I'll show you, show to, show you how to turn them on. Okay, so we're mostly going to be talking about flesh reading ease which is a specific readability statistic because it's so commonly used in the United States. And it's the one that Word calculates. And you end up with, you, you, you set Word to test this for you, and you end up with a number between 0 and 100. Actually, it looks like it's 30 and, and, and 100. The higher the number, the easier it is to read. Excuse me. You're excused. Um, so, so not knowing anything else about your audience, I know nothing about them. Um, if, you, if you knew nothing, you'd generally prefer the score to be between 60 and 70. Most magazines are written between, um, say, 70 and 80, um, because we want them to be easy and fun to read. Um, so, those, and have any of you heard of the term plain language? Okay, so if you go to plainlanguage.gov, the United States government has training materials already ready to teach people how to write at this level. It's meant for government writings to the public. Um, you might have to adapt them, but they're already available. You can get them and you can use them. Um, and it, 60 to 70 is considered plain language, and here's the good news. The research is so pervasive that most other countries have a plain language or a plain English or a plain whatever, plain Spanish. Um, they, ha they have an initiative to get the government to write in a way that is understandable. I'm going to show you some egregious examples in a moment. 
here's, here's Word. So in order to set this on Word, you just need to click Show Readability Statistics. So Word Options, I don't know what version you're using, but just open up Word, open up Word Options, and click Show Readability Statistics. That's the good news. Yes? So um, just out of curiosity, is there a specific reason why you wouldn't want to be higher, like 90 to 100? Or is it because right, it depends who you're writing for. So I worked with Santa Fe Community College, and we were designing um, how, how to do insulation. Um, and, and most of the people didn't read well. Um, it, it was government, government going into low-income homes and helping people increase the R values in their walls and, and see where all the gaps were. And so in that case, we would have been designing for at a much higher level. So this is a starting point. You need to know your audience. People say to me, well, if I'm writing for PhDs, um, can I write at, at, at a 30? It's like, no, because it's tiring and it's hard. Um, I'll tell you in a minute some of the differences. So the good news is you just set it, right? That's it. You're going to get readability. The bad news is you have to do a full spell check and it comes at the end. So if you're writing a book and you want to know the readability of that book, it's going to take you a few hours. Because you're going to have, like my books, have all kinds of misspellings on purpose as examples. So my readability comes down, looks lower, you know, it, but it's going to take the time. What I recommend is that if you're going to do this, you, you, do, you do an example, three, four pages of content. Run it through, it'll take you a few minutes, and you'll get some sense. My friend Stephanie told me that the first time she did this, and they designed training for, for power plants. So we're probably not writing um, at, at a um, post-college level. Um, and if we are, they're not going to understand it. And it's going to be hard. And it's true that even people who went to college have a hard time with higher levels of writing. The Wall Street Journal is only written at one level higher. Um, it's taxing to read things all day long that are hard to read. We know that, for instance, that people do not look up words they, they don't understand. They have too much to read. So they just keep going. Um, and so we have to write for, for ease of reading. Um, so here's another way to do this. And this is um, readabilityformulas.com. Super simple, real cheap. Um, if you don't use Word, and there is a there's a readability checker that goes with Google Docs as well. Um, I tend to use Word, so that's why I'm using Word to do it. So you go to readability formulas, and and you just copy and paste your text. So there's the copy, there's the paste, right? And then you pre press check readability, and here's what came up that it's 58.1, um, which isn't bad, because 60 is plain language. So at that point, you need to make a judgment, right? About, about whether, do you need to make it better? But here's what Stephanie did. She, she used this and ran some of her training through it. It was written at a postgraduate level. Um, and um, it was, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, it was a bit of a struggle for her to get her folks to care. We have to write all this over? Well, we, we don't write it over, we're, we're making it simpler, which is tactic two and three. Um, and it shouldn't take as long. So I want you to get some experience making things simpler so that you are already cued in that you need to simplify pretty much everything you did. When I wrote my books, they started out in the 40s. Not good. Um, they're now they're now between, all three of them are between 58 and 62. And I gotta tell you, I, I didn't know how to make them simpler. So um, maybe I was just lazy at that point. I don't know. So that's it, it's just, it's telling you. Um, and this will do other readability scores as well. 
So does anybody have a specialized audience? What's your specialized audience? Airline pilots. Airline pilots. So what would your guess be about the readability level? Are there any airline pilots in here? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I would err on the side of above 70. Okay. Slightly above 70. Okay. And, and here's the cool thing. Test your stuff. Try to make it simpler and see how simple you can make it. Sometimes it's just really hard to make it simple. And readability does not understand technical language. So um, it doesn't. Um, so if you're using acronyms or technical language, your readability is going to be too too low automatically. So the next question is, does your audience, is, is that word something they're going to go, what's that mean again? And if it does, then, then you've got some issues. If they already know it, um, then, then for them it's not a readability issue. Um, there's something called a closed test, C-L-O-Z-E, where you can check it. Um, you take every fifth word out or every eleventh word out. And give it to five people who are typical audience members and see if they can fill in those words. Um, and that that'll tell you. Um, it's, it's a next step to take. Um, so I mean, there's other things that I've done with clients. It, I, I've given it to audience members and said, circle anything that that doesn't make sense to you. And if you can write next to it, why? Don't understand this word. This sentence, I don't understand the sentence or whatever, so that you can get. Obviously, the mo more important it is that people understand things, the more important it is for you to take the time to do these things. If you're just, your boss says to you on a Wednesday afternoon, hey, by tomorrow I want you to send out information on X, you're probably not going to do readability testing. Although, I do it on the, pretty much everything now. So, anybody have that question? Come on, everybody, every, every time I do this, somebody has that question. Well, let me answer it for you with the research. Here's what the research says. Yes. Um, so I used to work at MetLife and we in insurance and we did um, a simplified customer correspondence initiative where we used the readability, did all of our customer correspondence and we had read some research, I just didn't know how this compares to, because it connects to this, that the reading level, average reading level of people in the United States is 8th grade or below. Uh -huh. So if you come at them with anything higher than that, it's just like an automatic Right. And some of the words we had, like annuitization, yeah. that automatically took it up to like a 13. Yeah. So we would we would do like a um, control F and replace that with a different word right. that matched the um, readability of the rest of the document to get an accurate read. And then we would do a control F replace Great to idea. put it back in. Right. Yeah. Put it, a simpler word in so that you get a real uh, a real readability because it's annuitization is going to be a problem. Yeah. I have, yeah. some, I have something interesting to share. I don't want to say much. So in the military, they have the aptitude, mental aptitude testing. And they find that people from certain communities score less. But with this reading, these kids score much higher. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a baseline from, from which you can make some decisions about whether this is written in a way that's understandable. That's all. At that point, you need to know your audience, you need to know what level they're at, and all of that sort of thing. Um, and so here's the research, you'll have the slides if you want to, if, because I'll tell you, when, when you tell your boss that you're going to do reading levels, they're going to say, why? Um, we cannot remember things we don't understand. We cannot apply things we don't remember. Um, and so, well, we can, but, but we can't deeply apply things. Um, so, um, Patty, yeah. just a, a, a shout out for those of you who write assessments or, or tests of any kind, readability is critical. Right, 
do readability tests in, in, in your tests because here's what we know. I, I do I do workshops on, on writing assessment items. Mm -hmm. If your readability is too high, thank you for bringing that up because it wouldn't have occurred to me. Um, if your readability is too high, then you're testing whether they understand the words, not whether they can do, whether they know what the right answer is. Also, if you use surveys for data collection, um, you get skewed results if your language is more complex right. than, than the reader can handle. Right. So, so they start guessing at answers. Right, and and then you then you have garbage. Um, and so it's really, really important. So just as a, a knowledge check for me, how does writing at the right readability level help memory? What's that? Understanding. Yeah, uh, if you can't understand it, you're, you're not going to process it well, and you're certainly not going to store it well. So my general answer is it just reduces the mental effort needed to learn from new information. Yes? Readability, fairly consistent, going from you know, boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Is it? I have no clue. Can you, when you when you contact me, ask me, and I'll find out because okay. it's a really interesting question. Um, I am reading right now. Um, I'm in the process of hopefully updating the writing book because reading reading from digital devices is not the same as reading from print. Um, and here's some of the things that I've seen in the research. I haven't put it together really well, so I'm. I don't have a great answer for you, but here's, here's some of the things I have read. One is that readability on digital needs to be lower, I mean higher, sorry, because, because um, there are other things about digital that, that vie for attention. So we've got to be simpler on, on, in digital. Um, which would, and something I read recently which made me very sad, that, that some of our youngest kids who are mostly communicating through phones, um, are losing losing their ability to read long texts. I, you and I went through school, and reading long texts and making sense of them was a very important part of, of teaching. Um, and they are they are those same tests now of reading comprehension of long texts, long meaning a page or more. Um, the reading comprehension has gone down dramatically because they're used to communicating in three three words or, or so. Um, Isn't that true also for vocabulary? Like if you read a book from the 19th century, hard. There's, it's super hard. You know, you you learn words that you never knew about. Right. You know. Right. And and for I, you know I um, I didn't find Shakespeare to be hard to read, but we read it. We read it for understanding and what does it mean, um, and th that was what they used in this particular test. That that uh, 16 year olds just couldn't simply couldn't couldn't process it. I just have a question about. I really struggle with this because my um, background is heavily academic and research based, and I wrote my thesis on 19th century British fiction, so I'm all about that stuff. Is there a tool, I find that I, I read over it or someone comments that it's difficult to read and it, it does not seem difficult to read for me, so is there a, it takes me a long time to sit and be like, is this too big of a word? And flip out and flop words. Is there a tool that can help with like, or is it just, a, is it just practice? I think, I, I think one is if you want to know if a section of text is hard to read, put it through readability. Right. Um, and if they need to read it anyway, um, I'm sorry, I just really stuffed up, um, and I know I sound funny. I'm kind of a little bit like when they give you laughing gas at the dentist. <laughs> and anyway, um, I, yes, my mind goes to weird places. Um, I, I, think, I think helping people process little pieces of text, putting it together, and over time they get better, but, but I was extremely sad to read that doing most of your reading on, on a phone 
reduces your ability to even process long taxes. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for you, but I'm happy to look stuff up because um, there's almost nothing that you could ask me that I'm not interested in. So just get in contact. Let's okay. let's let's check that one out. I, I mean, I don't know. So now we're going to cover two tactics, and it's how to make readability better. And you're going to do some writing. I'm going to give you some stuff that's hard, and I want you to break it up, make it in shorter words or whatever. Um, and I'll tell you exactly. Um, and the reason for using shorter, more familiar words is so we don't overload working memory with things it has to think about. Because um, working memory doesn't have to process prior knowledge. If you already know it, it doesn't have to reprocess it. So, so we want to use the things people already know to the best of our ability. And tactic two and three go together. Shorter, more familiar words, reduced sentence length. Um, both, both help working memory um, work more efficiently. So I'm going to give you some examples. This is my first example. These are some instructions. The instructions on the left are 30, it's one sentence or two sentences, but it's 36 words. And the instructions on the right are reduced to 18 words. So I'll give you a minute to take a look. Can anybody make it even better than I wrote it? Yes? Uh, take five minutes to improve the readability, readability of this passage. Correct. I wish I could say to you that I, that I did this on purpose um, so that I could let you uh, make it better, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, and every time I do this, the first couple of times I was embarrassed when somebody made it better than mine, and then, the, then I thought, great. Super, I'll leave it that way and ask people. So, and you're absolutely right. And that would be what, maybe nine words. Um, and really, so if you're working with faculty, and I work with faculty sometimes, I mostly do workplace learning, but work with faculty, um, we might spend weeks on just making their instructions easier to understand. Okay, um, the simpler words, making sentences shorter generally involves, if, if a sentence is, does anybody here know how to tell how long a sentence is in word? Highlight. Word, you just, you just highlight it and look in the bottom left. It tells you how many words it is. Um, you've got a sentence that's 20 words or so, or more, make it shorter. Um, and so the second, the second thing is to use simpler words. And this is one of my favorite um, simpler words list. Um, and I, I've got a, a place for you to go to get it. Um, give it to, you know, download it and give it to all your instructional designers. So for instance, instead of saying, according to our records, you would say, our records show. It, it, that's right off there. Um, instead of accessible, open, ready, within reached. You know, those sort of things. And so this is, this is a important way to learn how to write more simply. Okay, so first thing I want you to do is to break this one sentence into two to three sentences. I'm going to give you a minute to do that, and then I'll have you compare it to how I did it. That's one sentence. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, so see if you can, or if you don't want to to write it all out, just where would you put the periods? Give me a minute to, to just take a look. Where would you break this? I'm still trying to make it through the sentence. <laughs> I actually got this off government website. <laughs> Yeah. 
Ready to see how I did it? Or, or do you want? You want some more time? Okay, here's before and after for, the, for how I did it. That doesn't mean it's the best. It's just, here's it, here's it divided. Yeah. Is that easier to read? Yeah. Okay. Is it as good as it could get? No. What's wrong with it? What would you do differently? You could kind of like do simple, you could do like, sort of like break some of those uh, senses up and maybe bullet points. Yeah, bullet points is always good. And that's, that's one of the, the things that we've learned from research is that with digital, people skim. They don't read. Um, and so bullet points helps them do that. I you also don't need all of those adjectives, so like you don't need specific. There are rules about. Right. So you could take out some of that too. So some of the really good readability checkers, I use Pro Writing Aid. Um, it's one of my favorites. It will tell you, it will highlight every adjective. And if you've got 400 of them, they need to go. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Maybe. There's so much work to do after this. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. You can, you can talk to me about it because I got a PhD and, and learned to write more poorly too. <laughs> Great. So I used, I used to write a monthly column for a training magazine. And right about the time I was getting my PhD, my editor said to me, all right, Patty, you're fired. What? She said, your writing went from clear and, and concise to, to wordy and hard to understand. And it took me a good three to four years afterwards to get back to writing normally. Um, and, and yet, I still wasn't good enough because I used big words. And, and now, the more you do this, the easier this is. So what I did next is to make, the, make this simpler. Okay, so here's before the three, the three um, sentences, and there it is, simple. What do you think? Would you, do you like it, or, or would you do it differently? It's, I mean, it's, it was just gobbledygook, taking up space. Okay. All right, this is from a government training site on how to rehab old homes. And one of the problems with old homes is lead paint. So this is on the section on how, how to make lead, how to deal with lead paint. Um, and so this is just a description of what is deteriorated paint. <laughs> okay? So. What, what would you do with this? Let me give you a minute to just kind of process this sentence. Bizarrely enough, it's an incomplete sentence. Is it? It's 40 words, and it's an incomplete sentence. It has a period. It can be incomplete. <laughs> if it's got a period, it's a sentence. <laughs> It's like, there's a lot of parts just repeating what I already just said. Right, and, and my, my understanding of how to fix this was exactly what you said earlier. Yeah, that's what It's not bulleted, but, but it's, it's read for skimming. Mm -hmm. Definition, examples. That's it. Now, can anybody tell me how to make this even better? Because there's something missing here. You can draw pictures. Show, what, what's the difference between chalked and cracked and chipped and peeling? Yeah, I don't know what chalked is, to be honest. Um, so this one is an example where images would are needed. The dual process. Yes, mm -hmm, for dual processing. Am I going to remember peeling, chipped, chalked, no. and cracked? But, but if I could see it, um, and this is, this is visual, so it has to be visual. 
So how do simpler words and shorter sentences help memory? Faster processing. Faster processing. Faster, easier processing. This is cognitive overload. Cognitive overload, right. And I, I write about, about cognitive load a lot. And I'm, I'm sometimes surprised that, that we design instruction and we don't worry about the load that we're imposing on memory, which means we're doing all this work for, on someone else's behalf that can't be learned. Um, and that's a problem. So we can, there are ways, there are tactics that help us build on previous learnings that we have moved into long-term memory so that we can teach more. But when we don't do the very basics, we can't teach more. So the last one, I was hoping we'd get through this, um, is the need to check and fix understandings. And the reason for this is we have to make sure that the schema we're building are accurate. Do you know that there are still textbooks out there today, you were talking about airline pilots, about Lyft, that are incorrect. It's, the, it's, it's a previous understanding of Lyft, and it's not how Lyft occurs. So we know, we know how, how we get Lyft and why airplanes can fly now. Um, and there are still textbook, textbooks in the 2000s that have incorrect. We ha you cannot help people learn to apply, solve problems, do things, um, based on misunderstandings and misinformation. Um, I already answered that question. In, missing knowledge and misunderstandings damage learning because their schema are either missing elements that are needed to understand. Remember I said working memory makes, makes sense of what we're learning based on what we already know. And if what we already know is wrong or missing pieces, then we're going to have problems understanding. So this is just a very simplified way of explaining that we build that prior knowledge, the foundation of, of learning and application, from facts to understanding first before we can apply. Um, it's one of the reasons why certain training methods don't work with brand new people because they're too complicated. We can't throw somebody into an, oh, we can, but it's a recipe for overload. Um, I have friends that say, well, we should teach everything through this. Uh, one of the big ones is scenarios, simulations. Can you imagine throwing somebody new into, I don't know if you've ever seen this, I, there's a business simulation that I once tried. I don't, I don't know a lot about, about financial concepts. I mean, I know some, but you're running the company and time is moving and you can open things and read them and I, was, I wanted to cry. I didn't know enough to do that simulation. It's one of the reasons that some of these complex learning methods are best for people with prior knowledge because they can, they can use it. Um, so when people say, to, and the reason I put this in here is I get all the time people saying, we don't need to learn facts and concepts. We can look them up. Wrong. The facts and concepts are what help us understand. And the understanding is what helps us to apply. Um, yes? I think what people confuse is that um, you uh, while you might not need to memorize those facts, you have to know that they're there. Right. And, and, and sometimes you do have to, like for instance, um, does a doctor need to memorize how to stop bleeding? All the steps. Yeah. And you can't look it up. You just, or, or I have a friend who, who um, her son works as an armed guard at an Air Force base. Um, and He's the first line of defense. Um, he can't look up whether to shoot. Um, he's got to know. Um, the, and he's got to know it. It's got to be just like your grocery shopping. It's got to be fluid and it's got to be 
automatic. Um, so one of our jobs, and that's a, it's great that you brought that up, one of our jobs in designing learning is to know what people need to know so that they can understand the things we're teaching them and know how to look. If, have you ever looked up something on Google and not understood what you found? Um, and have you ever been on the phone with someone who you were quite sure was reading from a script and if you said to them, but it doesn't happen exactly that way, it does this. And, and they can't, can't do it because they're reading from a script. Um, they know how to look things up, they don't know what they mean. Um, so I, I want to give you an example of this um, because I've had a whole lot of issues with people saying we can look up everything. We can't. We can't, we can't fluidly perform in the workplace unless we have this foundation of whatever knowledge we have to remember. Um, you can't do math problems, for example, if you don't have, if you, it's the reason we were taught multiplication tables, because we use them all the time. Um, stupid Patty said to her dad, I'm not learning that stuff, and I can't do them. And I, I have to use a calculator, and I can't tell if the calculator's right. I just don't know. Um, willful child. Um, but, but, um, there's a lot of math you can't do if you can't if you can't do some some stuff in your head. Yeah. Have you done any? Uh, it's just knowing this and seeing this simplified model of uh, designing for learning and designing for memory. Have you done any work connecting this for um, into how we as L and D professionals conduct needs assessments, tasks analysis, to make sure that we're getting the right information so that we can support this? Because it yeah, I'm like there's a lot of information. It, but it's not the way that the way that we traditionally do them. I feel like there's area for opportunity based on kind of what it's. That's saying. a really good point. So she's say, saying, how do you take this into task analysis? And actually, I was just talking to a guy about that today, about applying this to to helping people understand enough about the tasks that people do and the mental the mental capacity and, and what they already know and, and those sorts of things because it's not enough to know what the task is. You have to know what do they already know that you can add to and build upon. Um, and do they, under, do they have any misunderstandings? Because um, misunderstandings just destroy further knowledge. And missing knowledge destroys further knowledge. Um, I don't. I don't have that information, but I, but I asked a guy today whether we could start a conversation about that. Because, because you're right. It's not enough, you know, it's like, what do we need to know about our audience? Well, one of the things we need to know is what they already know. How do we know that? Um, how do we figure out what they know? Um, and there are, there are good ways of doing that. One, one is to give them a simple task and see if they can do it. Um, do they understand the language? You know, it's kind of like usability studies. Watching people work. Um, can they do it? Um, there are ways to do this. So here, here's an example from food safety. Um, some training that I developed. Um, and so at the, remember, at the remember level, people need to understand the terms, like safe minimum internal temperature meats for the most part. Or if you're making um, something with eggs in it, it's got to have a safe internal temperature in the center um, because people cannot eat raw eggs and they cannot eat raw meats. Um, and so what do the, they need to know what that means and they need to know what rest time means. Um, rest time has to do with whether the temperature continues to go up after, after you take it out or it doesn't. Um, because you can take it out earlier if during rest time um, temperature goes up. If you've ever, I'm a cook, so if you've ever cooked a prime rib roast, you know that you can go from medium rare to medium in about two minutes. Um, so you want to take it out at, at, at um, 120, I believe, or 140. I uh, don't have my cookbook with me um, because it's going to rise in temperature over that time. So. At the understanding level, um, you want to know: Do people know why? Pe 
why something needs rest time? Can they apply that to a situation? Okay, um, this goes up, this will continue to rise in temperature. How soon should we take it out? Be able to think through things. Um, and a question like, this is an understanding question. Can you tell if food has reached a safe minimum internal temperature by just cutting into it? The answer is no, you can't. So at the apply level is this recipe, what, what is the safe internal minimum temperature needed for this recipe? Where you're pulling it all together, all the facts, all the terms, all the concepts, and, and you, you go beyond understanding to t say, well, this, um, this tuna casserole that has eggs in it um, probably needs, you know, should be around this temperature. Um, would we expect that temperature to rot, continue to rise? What is that dependent on? Um, so that, that's kind of how this, how this actually plays out in the real world. In your, in your own work, here are some of the most typical ways to check understanding. Can anybody look at this and, and tell me how they've used some of these methods in their own training? Because I'm pretty sure you do. Yes? Um, when we train for abnormal situations and emergencies, um, there's a lot of decision-making process that goes into, you know, do I divert to a different airport? Okay, how do I decide if that's a suitable airport? And that's not something you could put into quantity. You, you can't right. say this, these are the steps. And so we have people you know, practice making those decisions with, you know, with a given set of... So what are, what are some of the things, the foundational remembering and knowledge they need to know to be able to make those decisions? Um, well, you have to know things like fuel burn, are you going to have enough fuel to get there? Um, right. You have to figure out um, how to calculate that. Right. Um, and they have to yeah, be able to do it fluidly, right? Very, you know, they can't be like, Okay, does anybody back here have a calculator? Yeah. You know, it's, you, know it's, uh, you, you have to be able to do those things. That's all the remember stuff. And so, um, anyone else? Any under, checking for understanding um, activities? Yeah. So, uh, my users use a, non, uh, a registration system, um, and, and this, uh, this is for non credit students. And it, it basically starts off as uh, experiential learning where they job shadow against somebody for a minimal amount of time just so they can get familiar with what they'll be doing looks like. Uh, once they move from that phase, we move into the practice activities where they do a case with that, uh, let's say that senior, and then they'll watch a senior do a couple more. Then they'll do a case. So it's that practice of right. someone's still right behind you to help you. Right. Um, and then they start to move on into like their own cases. So. Uh, something comes in, it's like that knowledge check for understanding, do you know what to do next right. in the system? Right. Um, or do you ever show them like an error or something? It's like, what? why did this happen? Why did this happen? This is the reason why. Right. Um, go back, try again. Uh, where we encounter issues is the remembering part. Sometimes people forget the most basic things. Um, like, what screen am I supposed to do on to do this? Right. Like, things like that. And, and I think that's where uh, improvement can be made. Right, and, and what, what the research shows about that, and it's super clear, is, and this is not fun. Um, nobody wants to do this, but it's, it's spaced practice over and over. Um, yeah, where, where, where you keep hitting them, and I was talking about the call center earlier. That's one of the ways um, I helped a call center design a system, whereas week one, they got week one training, right? Week two, they got a two-thirds week two training, one-third checking, checking understanding from week one. Um, and then week three, they got, they got half of what week two, week three would be, and then checking understanding from weeks one and two. Um, so you are always, always revisiting. Um, and it's not necessarily fun, but that's how we remember. Because what it does is, is it just, it, it reprocesses and what we know about, about our brain is the more we process the same thing, the more solid that memory is. I would totally 100% agree with everything you said, but you always have to assess the environment. 
we did the same thing at Lowe's with a lot of practice going on on the floor. Uh, the failure of understanding of putting a good person in a bad system, the system went every time. Yeah, the constant pressure of labor on the floor to serve the customer with a onboarding program of 14 days uh, was, I don't have people on the floor, customers are getting pissed off, hurry through your training, get on the floor. Because a person on the floor, whether they know something or not, is a perception to the customer and I can serve. Right. So it's very critical to always look at the environment you're putting in because sometimes in that situation it's the ideal learning scenario. But, you but it may not be it, it may not be it won't practical. Be practice. Right. Yeah. So. Won't be practice. And and all a lot of these things, the things I'm talking to you about take time. Um, and how to implement them? Well, we've got technology. We've got we've got just all kinds of ways to do space practice. Um, I'm trying to remember a situation in, in which um, they had incentives for for doing space practice on their phone, um, and um, every week somebody won 100 bucks for doing the space practice stuff and getting the answers right. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say to? I was just thinking about. Um, we just did a. a coaching onboarding program for brand new uh, like performance and um, development coaches. Yeah. yeah that's the whole day. And um, would you say this process too, it's not just like, it, it's not a one time remember, understand, right. apply. No. It's for them it was like the facts that they need to know at this stage are very different from the facts they need to know at this right. stage. Right. So and, when and we tried to do an application that built every single week and referenced back. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. Um, to remember long term, we need to repeat and and have to bring that up, recall it from memory over and over. Um, one of one of the things that's really important to you and I is how are we going to do this? Instead of event-based training where the training's over, that training is never over. That there's always stuff going on. Um, and to your point, and it's a really good one, how do we change our organizations from thinking we can open people's heads and pour knowledge in and it's done and it's in schema? It's not. Um, and then they can't apply. And then they can't do their jobs, and there's costs to that. Um, so, you know, the question here for me became three years ago: what What are the things we can do? Um, and space learning is not in my well; it's in it's in the practice book, but I'm not convinced like you that we're going to get real far with that today, with being able to do that. But but that's how it's done. Um, just keep building the, pra the spacing of the stuff they learned earlier and recalling it from memory in every um, K through 12. They, they are now tell telling teachers, spend two-thirds of your time teaching, one-third of your time reviewing. So space practice every day. Um, people will learn more and remember more. Um, I, you know, how are we going to do it in training? I'm, I'm hoping that you will help me figure that out. Um, I've, done, I've done a bunch of this now with, with organizations, but we're not doing this for this, the information level stuff. This is the stuff that is, is mission critical. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about your example, Marty, and, and some onboarding as well. Um, you know, there is this there is this deep fallacy that I have to teach everybody everything they're going to need to do right. in their job. And if you can strip it down to what are the critical tasks, core. what are those core critical tasks where they can add value and then you focus there right. and you repeat and you reiterate and you build on so that they can successfully do three useful things at the end of your right. so that. That's powerful. That's, and one of those useful things that could be going to a simple job I on the floor. Right. Like what questions do I ask for somebody who's doing a yard project? Well, I can right. sit you in the back and take you to the 20 minute e-learning course that you're going to retain. I'll go, somebody's got a yard project, here's a job aid right here where you can walk through. Right. So, so 
this brings up some, because someone said to me, well, Patty, this all sounds like it takes more time. And it takes more time. And here's my answer to that. Get rid of the stuff that they can learn on their own, can learn from, from their buddies or whatever. Teach them the foundations uh, so that they can learn from other people even more easily, so that they have the basics. And yeah, teach the foundation to let the supervisor reinforce the knowledge. That too, Ab absolutely. And let, the, let them learn the extras and the nuances and everything else on the job where you normally learn stuff. We can't teach it people everything. So, I, so I'm ignorant to all this, but let me just share a scenario. So I'm in workplace security, especially in workplace violence. And this whole notion of active shooter and run night fight, I'm just I'm right. important to me because scenario-based training to folks like this does not make any sense unless they do it repetitively over and over again. Right, and, and so that they can do it. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I took karate. Um, and I, I was held up on the streets at gunpoint in Baltimore, because that's home for me. Um, and that man was on the ground before I even realized this. Uh, because I went three days a week to karate, and I didn't, it was, I had a schema for somebody putting a gun in my wrist. I'm not sure I even knew he had a gun in my wrist. By the way, I couldn't do that right now, so please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, and I haven't taken karate for a while, but, but, but at that time, I'm walking with a friend, we're in high heels, we were easy pickings, um, we both had nice purses, and somebody put something into my side, and I don't remember thinking, this is the power of schema. That man was on the ground, and, and when the police officer came, he was complaining that I heard him. Um, and there's a gun right next door, right? So, so the power of schema is to not have to consciously think about everything. So hold on for just a second. What, I, what I'd like to do is just give you, tell you where the um, slides are so that you can be, be um, writing this down. If you have any problems with the slides, every it's, it's, on a, uh, it's in a Google uh, Drive. So you shouldn't have problems, but if you do, just Patty at pattyshake.com and, and I will just send them to you. Yeah. I think there's always a big challenge when the, the job tasks are very complex and branches, but the learning is linear. Is linear, and we don't. Yeah, um, it's. I could go go off on this tangent, and, and I'll try not to. We have to make the training as complex as the job. We can't break it down into simpler because it's because we have to get people to the place where they can do it. And it's another reason why, and that, that requires a lot of practice, why we have to train on less stuff and train better on the stuff we train. Um, so that, that's where the slides are. You've got all my slides, and you've got uh, pieces from each of my books. And I'm going to stop now and let, let Guy give away the rest of my books. And if I love this topic. If you have any questions or you want to talk about it, please reach out. I will be home tomorrow afternoon. So I have, a, I have an email problem, and that is this. Once it goes below the fold or above the fold, I lose stuff. So email me on Friday or after. I'll be home, and I want to converse with you about this. Thank you.